Good morning. Good morning. So good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Glad those of you in the back got the word about the massive sinkhole up here in the front pews. Uh, glad you guys know about that. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 121. We just saw it on the screen. But the scripture says this. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The Lord will not strike you by day, or the, or the sun will not strike you by day, or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect you, protect your coming and going, both now and forever. The Lord is our protector, day in and day out, forevermore. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing hymn 619, Sunshine in My Soul. There is sunshine in my soul today. celebrate your birthday because it means you're still around for a little while so uh, so anyway I appreciate that and uh, thank you so much for your kindness well this morning as we are here to worship the Lord that's what this is all about is to celebrate the Lord and uh, we want to say welcome to you uh, if you are visiting with family or a friend or you just decided hey I'm going to go to church today we're glad you're here and uh, we welcome you we just pray that the Lord will encourage you in your faith walk uh, as you worship with us this morning and then I especially want to say greetings to all of our church family uh, I just appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord uh, this is a, a day we get to come together as family encouraging one another and I know you've already done that in Sunday school uh, don't you enjoy the Sunday school hour because it's where you really get to know one another and just study the word together and uh, I encourage you to be a part of one of our Sunday school classes. And then we want to welcome uh, Kyler's brother is here today. Is that right, Kyler? Now is, now, is his name Camden? So how's Camden doing this morning? 
All right. Well, we are just excited for Brandon and Danielle and their, uh, just the Lord's blessing on their family as uh, baby boy Camden. So you pray for them as uh, they adjust and enjoy having this second son. But we sure are glad to see you all here this morning. And uh, God bless you. I tried to get Kyler the other day. He came in my office, got, a, got him a couple of suckers, and he would take one home to Camden. He said he doesn't have teeth yet. He, he can't have <laughs> one. So it won't be long. You'll be having to share those suckers, Kyler. All right. We're going to pray, and I was asked before the service uh, especially to pray for Angie True, uh, who I've been told has been having quite a challenge uh, with some health-related issues, uh, blood clot issues and uh, that we just need to especially pray for her. So would you do that with me? Would you join with me as we pray and uh, we remember Miss Angie this morning? Well, Father, we want to thank you for the privilege to gather together today. Lord, a day that the family of God comes together and we remember uh, what the common bond is. It's, it's that we have chosen Jesus and Jesus has chosen us and because of that, we want to spend time with one another. Uh, Lord, like one man said, the Jesus in me wants to worship with the Jesus in every person in this place that has trusted him. So help us, Lord, to worship you properly, honorably. Help us to do it in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit will just have his way in our lives today. Speak to us clearly and help us to hear clearly. Bless this time together. We pray, Father, for, in a special way for Miss Angie. You know the details of her challenges and struggles she's been having. And we pray, you who are Jehovah Jireh, we pray that you would provide. And Lord, we ask that you would heal and that you would raise her up and deliver her and help these clots to dissipate, disappear, and that you'll protect her right now, Lord. And so we pray also for everyone in this room. I know there's many, as well as myself, we've gathered here with certain specific matters on our mind of, of a person, uh, of need. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would hear, that you will give peace, and that you will give comfort, and uh, that you will bless your people as they are calling out to you right now. Help us now, Lord, as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand once again. We're going to come together and sing hymn 535, I am thine, O Lord. Draws us nearer. 
And because he draws us near, we're able to lean on those everlasting arms of Jesus. Let's sing together in 453. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from.
If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn with me to Psalms 73 this morning? Psalms 73. Rodney, you forgot to mention Brad's age. Um, it's his 31st birthday this week, so be sure to wish Brad a 31st birthday. <laughs> Psalm 73. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all of your works. This morning, let's continue to tell of all of his works this morning. When the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within, when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in, I will trust in you, O Lord, in the silence I will. Thank you. 
Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 16 today. We are going to have a kind of a mini-series uh, for a couple of Sundays. And uh, this kind of came about as I was thinking about the year ahead. Uh, back in January, uh, praying and just planning for our sermon series. And uh, this thought uh, just came to me one day. Uh, you know, I'm, I think about our generation or, or today, uh, when you look at uh, what you hear on the news and what we see in life, uh, especially in this social media age, uh, I think if we defined our age, we would say it's all about me. <laughs> A lot of the things that we see, it's all about us. It's all about me. And I thought about that. I thought how tragic that is, that it's, it can become all about me. And the thought came, it's all about you, Lord. <laughs> it's all about you, Lord. That's who it's all about. It's not about me. <laughs> and it's not about you. And it's not about our families. It's about you, Lord. And so we're going to look at why it ought to be all about the Lord and the benefits of that. In Psalm 16, the key verse, I think, would be verse 5 where it says, O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Now notice that phrase, you are the portion. You are the chosen portion. This is the picture of David describing a choice that he made. And think of it this way, this idea of a portion or the cup. We're looking at a banquet table. And on that table is all kinds of delicacies. I mean, everything you can imagine uh, to your heart's content, it's on that table. And I mean, it's just all kinds of, uh, of good things. And you just have this big old banquet table, and you have all of these wonderful choices, and, and you're told you can choose anything you want on that table, but you can only choose one thing. And all the things that are there, that are there for us, you know. Oh, there's the, the cup of prestige. There's the cup of position in life. There's the cup of power. There's the cup of, 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 of profit. And you got all of these things to choose from. And then there's one cup. A cup that's kind of hidden. A cup that just seems insignificant. And it's the cup of the Lord. And you have a choice to make. Which cup are you going to choose? David says, I choose the Lord. And our sermon today is, the Lord is my choice. Out of all the choices we can make in life, out of all the choices David could have made in his life, he said, Lord, I choose you. I choose you. Now, folks, there are wonderful benefits that come when we make that choice, when we realize that it's all about the Lord, life should be all about the Lord. And when I make the choice that it is all about Him and He is my choice, there are these wonderful uh, benefits that result in that decision. And what are those benefits? Well, this chapter describes several, several of the Beautiful benefits that come when we make that choice to say, Lord, Yahweh, sovereign God, God above all gods, I choose you and I will drink from your cup. What are the benefits to make that choice? Well, let's look at some. Verse 1. He says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. There's the first one. The first benefit of when you decide and you make the decision that out of all the cups, out of all the little things that I could choose to focus on and to give myself to, I'm going to choose the Lord. I'm going to make Him preeminent. 
the first blessing of that choice is a divine protection that comes to your life. A divine protection. King James Version says, preserve me, O God. When I read that word preserve, I couldn't help but thinking about my grandmother who would preserve things. I mean, she would preserve pickles and she would preserve peaches and she would preserve. And I thought, is that what he's talking about? God's going to preserve me? And then I looked the word up and it said, well, there's several ways you can preserve things. You can, you can dry it out. You can refrigerate it. You can pickle it. You can salt it. And you can can it. I thought, boy, I tell you what, I hate to admit this, but that sure does describe a lot of us. <laughs> I thought, my goodness, some of us have been dried out and we're dry as dust. Now, I don't know if that's the kind of preserving David's talking about. Then we got the rest of us, we done got so cold and indifferent. We've been preserved. It looked like we've been stuck in the fridge. And then we got the other group that's sour. I mean, they're just sour about life and sour about all this. And then we got the salty <laughs> preserves. And we got those that are still kind of salty on the... You know, got some rough spots on them, and, and they've been preserved, but they're a little bit too salty, and then there's some of us just need to be canned and put on the shelf, you know, and forgot about it. But I don't think that's what David's talking about. He is not talking about preserving us in that fashion. This word means to watch over. He is saying, God, you watch over me. You are my refuge, and you are my safe place. Now, if you look at the, term, the way he writes this, he is saying to God, preserve me because I have trusted in you. I'll tell you what, that's a bold, confident statement that he is making to Yahweh. He is saying, God, I've chosen you, but I trust you. And because I trust you, you protect me. And folks, we need to have some holy boldness. We need to claim the promises of God. God likes it when we as his children recognize the promise and the benefits of our choice. And then we claim those promises and we hold God responsible to fulfill his promises. That's not arrogance. That's not coming to God and, 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 and a, in a spirit of a fist uh, raised. This is just coming to God and said, I put my trust in you and I know the result will be you're going to watch over me. You know, we sing that song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. I don't care about sparrows, folks. I'm glad His Eye is on me. His Eye is on you. When you choose the Lord, you have this wonderful, blessed benefit of a divine protection that is watching over you. That's why we don't have to fear living and we don't have to fear dying. John Piper makes this statement, he says, this teaches us that God will and God can bring you through life and death to full and everlasting pleasure. That's the promise that he makes. My trust is in you, Lord. And if he, God, is the one whom you are trusting, then you can claim this wonderful, wonderful blessing to know that the Lord is watching over me. He is preserving me. He will preserve me now. He will preserve me to the end. He will see me through this life of benefits that I've chosen Him while I live. And He will guarantee and He assures me that He's going to see me to eternity. And I can enjoy those pleasures of life. Oh, what a privilege that when we say the Lord is my choice... We have garnered to ourselves a divine protection. Then number two, verse two, O oh my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. The second benefit that David alludes to is a divine awareness. When you decide that the Lord is going to be your one and only choice, 
You decide I'm taking that cup and I'm leaving all the rest on the table. You have the benefit of a divine awareness. Now, what is that awareness? What does it, what does it make you aware of? The first thing is our deficiency. He says, my soul has said to Yahweh, you are my Adonai, you are my Lord. And then he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. You see what happens? When you make the Lord your choice, you recognize your deficiency. You recognize your inadequacy. You recognize your condition. He said, my goodness has become nothing in your presence. My goodness is nothing apart from you. Now, folks, that's the problem that we have, is it not? You know, I was studying a, a hymn by Isaac Watts where he wrote, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? Well, we changed that word, didn't we? We made it sinner. And I got to thinking about why did we change the word worm to sinner? I thought both words aren't really advantageous to us. They don't bode well for us as human beings. Why do we like the word sinner better than worm? Well, I got to thinking about it. You know, a worm is just a creepy, crawly creature. You ever notice when it rains a lot, they just show up? You know, there's just all over your driveway. And I tell you, not one time have I ever gone out there thinking, these poor little worms, I'm going to see if I can't save them. You know, I'm going to pick them all up and get them over here in the grass. No, you know what we do with worms? We make them bait. And then also, I've noticed when I have them all over my driveway, I just run right over them. I just squash them. A worm, just to be squashed underfoot. They're insignificant. They're nothing. And I don't think we like to admit I am nothing but a worm. I am nothing. In the presence of God, my goodness diminishes when it's compared to the perfect majesty of the Lord. I mean, we just can't handle it. My, my son has a phrase. He said, I don't know where I got it, Dad, but uh, I like it. And it's a little phrase for many of us. If you participate in anything sports-wise, especially men, we have a tendency to do this. But he said... The older I get, the better I was. <laughs> Haven't you noticed that? You know, I'll be honest with you. I'm surprised my house is not full of just state championship trophies just all over the place. I mean, I mean, I, just over the years, I, I, I just can't believe how great an athlete I was. You know, I really wasn't. But over time, we were better than we were. And isn't that life? Folks, if I could take you with me this afternoon, and we knocked on doors all over this county, and here's what you'll hear. Ma'am, sir, why do you think you're going to heaven? If you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Let me tell you what, 99%, here's what they say. I guess I would say, I've tried to be good. I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I'm just as good as the, uh, the next person. And every one of them, in their mind, they think they're, they're good. <clears throat> They think they're good enough. Folks, we think we're good enough. But I tell you, when you choose the Lord, you realize that your goodness is nothing. You realize your deficiency. I mean, folks, that's just natural, is it not? I mean, we don't want to admit that we're not as good as we think we are. You know, last night my team got beat by Duke. And I know the Kentucky fans, I appreciate your, your cheering. I've had to get on some of you. You said, oh, I was cheering for your hog. I know what you were doing. You weren't cheering for the hog. You were rooting against Duke. That's what it was. Now, wasn't it? Come on now. You weren't rooting for those hogs. I hadn't heard any of you saying, woo pig suey. Man, some of you try to send it. I think it was Danny Humphreys. He just can't get it right. Suey pig suey. And I'm thinking, oh, Danny, don't even try. You're just making a mockery of my, my team. It's woo pig suey Razorbacks, okay? You folks are saying, oh, I'm cheering for you. No, you're cheering for Duke. But you know what we got beat last night? You know who I was cheering for now? Go Duke. I know you don't like that, but you know why? Let me tell you why. Because I want to be able to say the team that won it all is the team that beat us. <laughs> last year, who beat Arkansas? Baylor. Who won it all? Baylor. Oh, boy, we're a lot better than you think we were. Who's Kentucky cheering for now? 
St. Peter's. <laughs> I wonder why. Now, folks, we've got to be honest. We do not acknowledge our deficiency. We think we're just a little better than we really are. But when we choose the Lord, we realize how deficient we are. But here's the, here's the beauty of it. We realize how sufficient He is. We say, oh my goodness, I had no hope. But because He's sufficient, He makes it my deficiency sufficient. Not only do we see our deficiency and awareness of that, but we also see and we have an awareness of consequential choices. Look at verse 3. He says, as for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom all is my delight. However, those who hasten after another God, their sorrow shall be multiplied. And I won't even take their name on my lips. Let me tell you the second thing you'll be aware of. You are aware of the consequential choices. Here is a man who made the choice to say, Lord, you will be preeminent in my life. You are number one. And the choice to choose the Lord over and above all brings a new perspective and a love for others who have made the same choice. It's like David is saying, I delight in those who prize God. My heart is with those who have made the same choice. And the decision to choose anything else in place of Him is ultimately a decision for multiple sorrows. Matthew Henry says, They that multiply gods multiply griefs to themselves. For whosoever thinks one God too little will find two too many, and yet hundreds not enough. That's exactly what David is saying there in verse 4. You see, Jesus came to destroy, not patronize, the works of the devil. And David said, when I made my choice, I had a new awareness. He said, there's a, there's a remnant, there's a group that has made the same choice. And that's where my heart goes. That's where my body goes. That's where my fellowship is found. That's where my friendship is found. I am surrounded by those who have made the same choice. He said, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Now, folks, here's a good question. If you say you've made the choice to make the Lord supreme, what choices do those you are closest to make in life? What choices are those that you are closest to make in life? Question number one, are they Christ-honoring choices? Those who you have called your bosom buddies, your buddies, your friends, are they Christ-honoring choices that they make? Do they encourage one's witness for Christ? Do they support the importance of God's church, God's family? Do they impact the kingdom of God positively? Because David says, when he made the choice to make God his portion, he said, I found that my connection was with, was with a new family, was with a new uh, uh, friend, with a new Fellowship. And so we need to see that the choice gives us a divine awareness. And then number three, I believe we get the benefit of, of a divine control, an awareness of a divine control. Verse 5, he says, O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup, and you maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I believe that when you make the Lord your choice, you will learn that He is over all. He is in control. He says, you maintain my lot. That means you are ruling over my life. You are the sovereign one. You are uh, the sovereign one, and I am glad. You are holding my place. You are deciding my lot. Folks, we learn that it's not by chance, it's not by luck, it's not by circumstances, the things that happen. It is by sovereign design. He is in control. One person said, we must come to see that our God either causes it or He controls it. When whatever we face in life, our God has not lost control. 
And I know people will say, well, but you know, we can do some stupid things and we can make decisions and, and, and that can change everything. Let me tell you something about God. God is not up in heaven watching every turn we make to the point that he's up there saying, oh, I just hope Brent, oh, oh, I just hope Brent goes right here. Oh, oh, I just hope he goes right because if he didn't go right, he's going to throw off everything in the eternal ages. It's just going to mess everything up that I had planned for the way things would end. And he's sweating bullets. Just like, oh, I just hope, uh, I just hope John, I hope Brad, I hope Susie, I hope they just make the right choice because it all depends on what direction they go that determines how the outcome is going to be. Folks, that's foolish. God is sovereign. God guides. God leads. God provides. God directs. But when we make a wrong decision, when we make a bad decision, let me tell you, Sovereign God doesn't just say, well, we've got to scrap all the plans and we might as well rip Revelation out of the Bible because now because of what they did, it's not going to turn out the way I planned. Let me ask you a question. Are things going to end the way God says they're going to end? It sure is. It's going to end the way God said it's going to end. And you might be a part of, uh, of God's plan and you're walking in His will or you might be backslidden and you have, have ventured away. God's plan will be fulfilled with or without us, but the decisions we make is not going to hinder sovereign God from being in control of all things. And folks, here's the benefit of that. That means when I know that He is in divine control, that I'm not God anymore. That every choice and every decision I make, it's like eternity is hinging on the next decision. I hear people say, well, you know, I just want to make sure that, that I buy the right toothpaste because I want to be in the will of God. Now, folks, we're getting a little careless and silly when we start doing that. We need to recognize that God is sovereign and He is over all. And that means that I don't have to just grin and bear it in life when it's hard or make it worried, oh, did I do the right thing? We need to exult in the fact and praise God in the fact that He is in control, period. He's sovereign. And since God rules over my lot, notice he says, verse 6, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Since God is sovereign, I made my choice to say, Lord, I will choose you because it is all about you. He then hems me in. He puts boundaries in my life. He puts uh, borders, as we would say, in my life. What is he doing? He's hemming me in. He's fencing me in to himself. He wants me to recognize how wonderful He is, how marvelous He is, that He's a God that will never fail me. He has an inheritance that is everlasting. He, his way and His borders are good and they're right and they're healthy. When we recognize the sovereignty of God and rest in that and trust Him in that way, we will be whole. We will be healthy. We will find a healthiness mentally and emotionally. You look at the world today. We're knocking down the lines. We're knocking down the barriers. We're knocking down the boundaries and the walls. And we're saying, I will do what I desire. And we follow our own passions. And what does it do? It leads us to a place where people are mentally messed up. Psychologically messed up. Emotionally messed up. Because they have not made the Lord their choice. And they don't see the blessed benefits of those lines, of those boundaries that He has placed around us for His glory and for our good. That's the benefit we have. We are aware of a divine working, a divine control that is going on in our lives. Then number four, we also have the benefit of a divine counsel. Verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Now what does He do? He gives us counsel that is good. He gives us guidance. His counsel is to cause us to seek Him, to run to Him. It's a counsel that leads and guides us even in the dark moments of life. That's, I think that phrase there, even in the night seasons, my heart instructs me. That could refer to the moments of 
of, of difficulties, when things are bleak, could be like the Job moments where we're just wondering what happened. <laughs> you know, why did it happen? And the devil is tempting us to blame the Lord and to get mad at God in the minutes, moments of those dark moments. But what happens? We draw from the counsel of the Lord. How do we get God's counsel? Well, David, David got, he received God's counsel from the Torah, from the law of God. He, he knew the word of God. He studied and read it. But then he had the privilege that God literally was giving David uh, words. He was giving him direction. And David wrote them down. That's why we read this, the Psalms and read some of the counsel that God gave him. So he received counsel from the Lord. Folks, we get the same counsel. Our benefit is it's already written down clear. I don't know about you, but I hear people always want to say, man, I just wish God would speak to me audibly. I'm glad he doesn't, because I'd write it down wrong. I'd flub it up. I'm glad it's already black ink on white paper. I don't have to guess or like, now what did you really mean there, Lord? What, what did you really say there, Lord? Now, I don't want to get this right. No, I just go and open the Bible. There are 66 books in this Bible. There's 66 books. I would encourage you this year to set a go to read 66 books. This Bible. Read all of them. Read the books because in them we find His counsel. We find His guidance. We find instruction. We find direction. And folks are running here and there to get counsel. We go hire counselors. We hire psychiatrists. We hire psychologists. We run to all of these places. Sometimes before we run there, we ought to run to God. We ought to run to His Word. We ought to say, God, I've chosen you. And you have promised that you would give me counsel. And Lord, I need your counsel. And we need to rest and be quiet and sit before the Word and read the Word and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, teach me, speak to me, show me your way. Help me through this dark time. Help me through this decision making. Help me to see your will. Because you promised you would show me your will. And folks, we need to recognize that one of the benefits of a child of God is we can go to the author. We can go to the source. We can go to the one that wrote it. And we can talk to him and ask him for his counsel. That's a benefit that we ought to take advantage of. We ought to ponder it. We ought to think on it. And in those quiet moments, dark times, we begin to overcome the battle with what we see and the, ba and the battle with what we feel. And we know that His counsel will lead us to remember that He is going to protect us. That's a benefit. And then last of all, verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. You will not leave my soul in, in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What is this benefit? I think it is the benefit of a divine satisfaction. A divine satisfaction. Folks, when I put these three verses together, to me it speaks of fullness, number one. The fullness of of life. He talks about gladness and joyfulness and his whole being. He said, my glory rejoices. He is saying, my whole being is settled. This speaks of fullness of life. There's a divine satisfaction. You go to that table and you choose anything else on that table but the Lord, you're going to have to come back again because you'll find that money can't buy what you're looking for. You'll find that position in life won't uh, help you find what you're looking for. Relationship won't help you find what you're looking for. You have to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. But when you choose Him and make Him your chosen portion, He will fill you to the full. You'll find gladness and joy and the sense of being settled. Not only fullness, but I think assurance and confidence. He said, you'll not leave my soul in the grave. Folks, I want to tell you, it feels good to be able to announce that because I made God my choice, He's going to see me through this life and He's going to get me to the next. He's going to see me through this temporal world, but He's also going to see me to my eternal home in heaven. 
I have assurance. I have a confidence. I don't have a no so salvation. I don't have a hope so salvation. I have, excuse me, I have a no so salvation because my confidence is in the fact that He's promised He will not let my soul be in the grave. He will not allow me to see corruption, but He will see me through. He will you too. He will you too. That is a satisfaction. And then last of all, there's the satisfaction of His presence. And his pleasures. He says you're, in your presence is fullness of joy. Folks, if, it, if there was only one of these benefits available, I would choose him for that one benefit. But we've just looked at five. <laughs> and we hadn't even really, we just touched the hem of the garment as they would say. My question to you today. What did you choose at the table? What cup did you pick up? What cup are you depending on? Is it all about the Lord? Is your life, is it really all about the Lord? Is it? Have you made that choice? You know, verse 10, we know this psalm, as it even starts, it's called a mictum of David. That word means a gold golden psalm. Some say this psalm is really just, you could just describe Christ all through every verse. It just describes everything, everything about Jesus, what he, what he dealt with, what he went through. Verse 10, we can't help but see our Savior. You will not leave my soul in the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Folks, I think that we must remember that the reason we can make that choice is because of the choice Jesus made. He made the choice to take our place. He died on the cross so we can have the opportunity and the ability and the possibility to choose Him, to say yes. I choose you, Lord. You are the portion. If you're here today and your hope of heaven is based on anything other than the fact that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you acknowledge to Him, I am a sinner. My goodness is nothing apart from you. Or in your presence. And acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way. The only way. And you've yielded your life to him. You said, Jesus, I trust you. I place my faith in you. I receive you. If you can't answer why you're going to heaven in that way, you need to come today. You need to come today and say, today it's time for me to put that cup I picked up and put it back on that table and I, I'm ready to go pick up and say, I choose you, Lord. I'm choosing you. If you're a Christian, you may need to come today and rededicate your life because you, you'll say, Brother Brad, I, I honestly, I chose the Lord. I know He was speaking to me and He was choosing me and I said yes and I chose Him and I made that choice, but, but I'm telling you, I just sort of, I sort of put that cup down. And in a foolish way, I've been pursuing all these other gods. And all it's doing is multiple sorrows, multiple sorrows, emptiness. You need to rededicate your life. You need to go back and say, I need to get back to the cup I chose. And let that become my focus, my life. I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. We need some people to come today because I know, I know in a crowd this side, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people here that are genuinely saved. But you are not letting that choice be the thing that changes you. You're still seeking in all the wrong places. I think it'd be a wonderful day for you to come and just say, Oh God, I rededicate my life to Jesus. I've drifted, I've departed, and today I want to come home. I'm ready to pick that cup up again make my life all about you, Lord. Would you come? Come and be saved today.
We're going to stand and sing a hymn. And as we sing, I want you to come. And say, today it's time for me to be all about the Lord. Too much about me. It's time that it needs to be all about Him. You come as we sing. I'll be here to help you and wait for you. You come as we sing.